Chinese communism could collapse. Xi Jinping's rule could collapse. Listen, we don't know that the stock market isn't yeah. going to <laughs> resume its plunge and that there isn't going to be a crash of the stock market in China uh, akin to what happened in the United States in 1929. We don't know that the real estate um, uh, bubble that's been blowing up and blowing up with easy money and massive corruption in the banking industry, that that isn't going to burst. Uh, the Chinese economy, embedded as it is uh, in so much corruption, so much guanxi, so much insider trading, has a lot of vulnerabilities. I'm not saying there's going to be a collapse, but I think there's a vulnerability. And the system is sitting on such fragile moral and political legitimacy that if there's a cra uh, crash, the whole thing could implode. When it implodes, the only thing they'll have left to rally the Chinese people and keep them at bay and try and either prop up communism or if the military or some other set of Putin-style elites come in to try and legitimate their rule, the only thing they'll have left is aggressive nationalism to say, we're the great country, we're not going to be humiliated, this is our water, this is our land, uh, these are our resources, we've been through a century of humiliation by the West and the world, it's over now, we've got the military to reverse it. So if you're looking at a great rising power with all these resources, a growing navy, a growing military, a lot of people in the country that are nervous about their, their well-being, feel the insecurity of an uncertain status for themselves, individually, their families, and in a way their civilization. It's a kind of angry tiger and you don't want to rattle its cage. That's the single most important thing I can say to you this evening is you don't want to rattle its cage. Now let's come to Taiwan. Um, the Mayan Zhou era is drawing to an end. Uh, we know where he stands in popularity in the polls. <laughs> we know how easy it has been for the KMT to recruit uh, a large number of presidential candidates. Uh, if you look at the number of presidential candidates that the Republican Party has in the United States now, where they can taste and smell the possibility of returning to power, and you look at the number of presidential candidates uh, that the KMT has right now, uh, and you see the consensus that's emerged around the DPP, where its presidential candidate is already now clearly established and I, I think has obviously unified the party uh, versus the KMT, which is just kind of really in ruins. Uh, one always needs to be cautious about predicting, but I think it's highly likely, and I think most of you in the room think it's highly likely that Tsai Ing-wen will be the next president of Taiwan. It's going to be historic change in many respects. Last time, Chen Shui-bian, as you know, was elected by accident. I think we ought to be honest in this room. He would not have won if the KMT had not split in this fatal way between James Sung and Lian Chan. Um, of course, once you're president, you have some natural advantages uh, in terms of the power of incumbency and running for re-election, but this is not going to be by accident. This is, I think, going to be, unless something dramatic changes, as much of an electoral earthquake as happened in 2000. First of all, because it's not completely unimaginable that the DPP could win a majority in the LIFA UN as well. You look at what happened in the city and county elections uh, last December, and you know the, the electoral ground is changing in Taiwan, and Taiwan has be become to a degree that has no parallel in its history as a democracy, 
a genuinely two-party competitive system, very competitive, very uncertain, anything could happen. So, um, in all likelihood, one doesn't want to um, be too uh, deterministic, but the, in all likelihood, she will win a, a clear victory uh, in the presidential election next January. I think she's an enormously talented politician. I've met her three times. Uh, I've been very impressed with her intellect, her pragmatism, but yet obviously I think, you know, she's got a very strong core of conviction as well. I think this is one of the reasons she's been able to unify the party. Now, you're mainland China. You've been doing business with Mai Ying Zhou. You've gotten this big architecture of relations, uh, uh, the ECFA, all of the you know, proliferation of direct ties, 1,200 flights. I think they said a week. It's unbelievable <laughs> between Taiwan and uh, different cities in the mainland. And then you see the DPP president come to power, uh, who's you know got a different view about what the relationship should be than the so-called 1992 consensus. It could be an uneasy, at best, it will be an uneasy period of adjustment. Uh, the Beijing authorities have grown kind of comfortable dealing with Ma Ying-jeou and the KMT government. Um, they, uh, they know him, you know, he's someone they can do business with, uh, and so on. At a minimum, they're going to be very nervous about her and whether she's going to start down the same road uh, that Chen Shui-bian did after he was elected president. I'm just going to be honest with you. If that happens again, I think it's going to be catastrophic for Taiwan. This is a different China than it was in 2000, and it's got a, a, a vastly different set of power capabilities, not only for um, conventional warfare, but for asymmetric uh, a digital warfare uh, than uh, anything that could be imagined uh, in the year 2000. And this is happening at a time, now we come to the United States, uh, where the United States Navy is shrinking, the United States appetite for military conflict anywhere in the world is shrinking, and um, you know, we just got our hands full. You look at the Middle East, uh, you look at the other problems we have with China in Asia, uh, you look at the rise of the Islamic State, uh, you look at the problems of a very aggressive and militaristic Russia and their gobbling up of independent territory in Ukraine, uh, Greece, you know, melting down. It's a lot of problems in the world. We don't particularly need or want a problem uh, in the Taiwan Strait. So um, my uh, uh, concern is relieved a little bit by the fact uh, that, as all of you know, Tsai Ing-wen uh, has a lot of experience dealing with cross-strait relations. Uh, she would be uh, the first president of Taiwan to have been the chair of the Mainland Affairs Council. She understands international trade very well. As you know, for a time she led Taiwan's international trade negotiations. This is one of her areas of expertise. So um, I don't think she's ready to uh, embrace the 1992 consensus, which I will be honest with you would be my preference to see her do, you know, she could say, okay, we have some notion of one China, we see it in cultural terms, you see it in other terms. Uh, but in any case, I think she will, there's a good chance she will find a balance uh, between not embracing the, the 1992 consensus, but not doing things that would be provocative to disturb the relationship or antagonize the mainland 
in a period of time when the mainland may, may go through a lot of political instability, has a rising military, and is going to be hypersensitive. Um, uh, and she, I think she will attract very capable people to her cabinet. Now, what happens with the United States, a lot of it will depend on who is president. And um, on the one hand, I think that uh, there is still a strong consensus in the United States for um, uh, the Taiw behind the Taiwan Relations Act and behind a recognition of the commitment of the United States to ensure that there's no change in the status uh, of Taiwan vis-a-vis -vis the mainland that isn't mutually agreed upon. So I believe that that will be sufficient if, you know, there's a lot of uh, uh, good strategy, patience, uh, a certain amount of forbearance, and a lot of preparedness. We must maintain a strong military deterrent, both by Taiwan in its own defense posture and not least by the United States with our military deployments. And if we find the right balance, I think that we can uh, ensure that Taiwan uh, maintains its security, maintains its freedom, and somehow navigates what I think is going to be a difficult passage. But obviously, who is president of the United States will have some impact on how forward-leaning the United States might be. I'll just say one last thing and then I'll answer any questions or respond to any, any comments you have. Um, if you think about how is this going to be solved, what's going to be the final resolution of this, here's my vision of how it's going to be solved. I think that China is going to be a democracy someday, mainland China. Um, and uh, at that point, once it's a democracy, it will have to be a federal system. <coughs> and um, because it's too big a country to have centralized rule. In fact, it's ridiculous <laughs> to, to have as much centralized rule as China has now. And there's a concept that a lot of people have been talking about for quite some time now of not uh, a federal system, but a confederal system, almost like the European Union. So you've got independent states, but there might be some kind of architecture or chapeau or common association around that. And so people have for some time now, scholars and political theorists, been thinking about a long-term resolution in which Taiwan would, would someday, by a democratic China that has the self-confidence to do this, and the valuing of democracy and autonomy to do this, recognize Taiwan as an independent country, but then create kind of a greater association of China that might have you know, some role for Taiwan in association, and then you might have different layers of autonomy. You'd have the normal Chinese provinces, <laughs> Hong Kong and Macau, with more autonomy. The other um, special autonomous regions, Tibet, Xinjiang, more autonomy. That's the only way you'll solve those problems as well. Uh, and, you know, different, different elements of the region would have different connections to Beijing. That's probably decades away, but I think it's something where if China were to become a constitutional federal democracy, it's a resolution one could imagine. Anyway, with that, whatever people want to ask about or talk about, I'm happy to do.